can go more slowly than others, provided it is assumed that the wind or the roar or some other similar means assist them not at all. <coughs> it is not, properly speaking, wave, which is the cause of this retardation, uh, since the boats are going down and not upwards. It is the form matter itself, which originally is inclined to slowness or privation of speed. Not indeed to the lessening of this speed, uh, once it has already received it, uh, since uh, that would be acting. But uh, through moderating by its receptivity the effect of the impression when it is uh, to receive it. And then uh, a bit later, let us compare, I say, the lab and water with the defects to be found in the qualities and the action of the creatures. And we shall find that there is nothing to suggest as this comparison. The current is the cause of the boat's movement, but not its retardation. God is the cause of the perfection in the nature and the actions of the creatures, but the limitation of the receptivity of the creature is the cause of the defects that are in its actions. And this is, uh, again, uh, a pretty traditional line. Uh, it is, uh, um, is running there. So it seems to me that these uh, texts indicate that inertia or resistance to motion uh, is not only the result in bodies uh, of the primitive passivity which characterizes of at bottom of this uh, primitive passive and uh, primitive uh, um, passive power is is the fact that the creatures are limited. <laughs> so it is a, a lack. And it is uh, not only uh, as it were uh, an analogy, like it says uh, it is a sample an echantillon of the results that uh, create really limitation uh, as uh, in uh, bodies. As I read it, uh, uh, the creative limitation <coughs> is manifested uh, in uh, these uh, derivative features of bodies, uh, which are well-founded phenomena, which express uh, this uh, um, primitive uh, passivity of created uh, substances. I would therefore venture to say that Leibniz's notion of primary matter is at bottom nothing else than his notion of creatory limitation. For Leibniz, the notion of primary matter expresses the fact that creatures who are limited and imperfect have an intrinsic facility from which features of bodies such as impenetrability, resistance, and inertia ultimately result. Okay, now some objections uh, to this interpretation as uh, um, primary matter, not as a, a positive ontological constituent uh, of uh, models. First of all, one could say, well, uh, uh, Leibniz speak uh, of uh, <coughs> primitive uh, passive uh, power. A power as such indicates the ability to do something, to produce uh, a result, to cause a certain effect. If it can produce a certain result, effects, if it is a causal power, it cannot be non-being. Primitive passive power seems to have its own fundamental metaphysical operation. As we have seen, it is the source of such pervasive features which we observed in the phenomenal sensible world as resistance, impenetrability, inertia. An aspect of creatures which has such a fundamental, fundamentally important results can hardly be mere non so the objection. On the other hand, uh, these very results uh, seem to indicate, uh, after all, uh, some kind of uh, activity. 
It seems to me that proper powers, uh, precisely insofar as they do something, uh, can only be active. This is the sort of power as uh, the, maybe the ability to be affected, uh, but is not uh, really a power in the sense of uh, something uh, which can uh, produce uh, certain uh, results. It seems to me that passive powers are at the bottom uh, just a way to describe uh, the effects of the limited and imperfect active powers of creatures precisely insofar as they are limited and imperfect. So in short, this is my point. Powers can only be real powers, can only be active powers. And when we speak of passive powers, as Leibniz does, it's just a way to describe the effect that the limited, imperfect powers can have. Well, one could still say, well, look, but Leibniz in this test is specifically talking uh, of uh, creaturely limitation as causing certain features uh, of uh, the uh, bodies uh, of which we have experienced. Uh. So he specifically uses this uh, notion of cause. Well, it seems to me that Leibniz uh, uh, is using the notion of cause there in an extended uh, loose sense, and that uh, what the issue that uh, was actually to distinguish between uh, cause and reason. So it seems to me that there is a distinction to be had uh, between uh, the reason of something and the cause of something. And this is a distinction which indeed Leibniz uh, uses uh, when he is on uh, uh, more uh, high alert uh, metaphysical uh, duty. Uh, for instance, when he is talking about God, uh, uh, he says, uh, well, there is a, a reason of the existence of God, but not the cause of the existence of God. And it seems to me that uh, this uh, uh, comes across in a letter uh, to the Volder of 1704, where Leibniz says, uh, I quote, matter can be said to be real uh, insofar as there is in simple substances the reason, uh, in this case he says the reason, uh, not the cause, uh, of what is observed uh, in a phenomena that is passive, unquote. So note that Leibniz is not saying that matter is real, he's saying that matter can be said to be real insofar as we recognize in the monad, the limited, I do that, the limited active power of the monad, the reason for the Passive and the passive without the active is incomplete. In the um, quotation from the Volder, he specifically says that they come together to complete the monads. However, it seems to me that uh, this is uh, purely a distinctio rationis, uh, and uh, that uh, what Leibniz uh, is uh, saying uh, is uh, simply try to, as it were, uh, try to explain uh, something which is uh, uh, not really distinct. So these are not two really distinct ontological constituents coming together to uh, make substance. And I think uh, um, there is uh, a reply to Bernoulli, which is particularly revealing in this context, because Bernoulli said, uh, says uh, to Leibniz, uh, well, if you say that uh, the active without the passive is incomplete, uh, then uh, you are saying uh, that uh, God, uh, who is a uh, pure act, uh, is uh, incomplete. And the Leibniz replies, God doubtless is a pure act, 
since it is most perfect. But imperfect things uh, are passive, and we conceive of them otherwise. Uh, and if we conceive of them otherwise, uh, they are taken uh, incompletely. Sumunto incomplete. Incomplete. Seems to me that Leibniz is making here a distinction. He's uh, saying uh, if uh, we conceive of them uh, without this uh, limitation, uh, then uh, we are uh, uh, not uh, capturing uh, what, is, uh, what it is to be a, a, a creature, basically. Now, it seems to me, to me that this interpretation is consistent uh, with Leibniz, uh, again, a revealing addition to a letter of Arnold of 1687, uh, that matter, I quote, uh, is uh, always uh, essential uh, to the same uh, substance. Leibniz and primary matter can no longer be thought of uh, as uh, the Aristotelian uh, substratum, uh, of substantial change uh, that can belong uh, to different substances uh, as long as a new form inheres into it, depending uh, um, on whether there is uh, this form, it would be a base or it would be a statue or whatever. Leibniz and primary matter is always essential to the same substance. As I think you have this concerning the question of whether an entity may change matter, I draw the following distinction: an entity changes its organic body on a primary matter. Primary matter is essential to any entity and is never separated from it since it completes it uh, and is uh, itself uh, the passive power of the entire complete substance. Therefore, although God, uh, to his absolute power, could uh, deprive the substance of secondary matter, or primary matter, for from this he would produce a pure act uh, as he himself belongs. You see from this uh, that incomplete substances are abolished, uh, they are a monstrosity in true philosophy. So what Leibniz is saying here, this is a metaphysical impossibility. And therefore not even God that could do it. Because it would be like the same. Is a, that is not strictly impossible. Whereas in the case of secondary matter, although Leibniz thinks that naturally, a monad is always embodied, it is metaphysically possible that God could create a monad which are without a piece of secondary matter. In sum, primary matter or primitive passive power as corresponding to creaturely limitation is not a something, a positive ontological constituent added to form, to make a substance, but merely a way to indicate that creatures lack further perfection, that is a way to indicate that there are degrees of active power or activity which creatures do not have. I come here to my conclusion. I propose that Leibniz considered the view in his mature metaphysics is that the matter of things is nothing that is a limitation. For Leibniz, a primary matter is just a noun, a term to describe the limitation of the only one actual constituent of simple, that is, uh, metaphysically primitive substances. This has momentous consequences for Leibniz's uh, theory of substance. At the most fundamental ontological level in Leibniz's system, there is no matter as a, some sort of things, stuff, vest, uh, to be combined uh, with form. This is why I think uh, in certain mature presentations of his ontology, Leibniz 
leaves out uh, primary matter in monads uh, altogether and speaks that are solar-like, uh, that is, intelligence uh, centers of uh, activity. So I think uh, really there is only one constituent there. And in uh, other tests, Leibniz speaks uh, of the dynamic as uh, the source of both the active and the passive, only one principle. So our contemporary sensibility recoils from the claim that matter is nothing, or even worse, that matter is evil. We are not used to thinking these <laughs> terms. But one has to ask what that claim really means. That to allow such a thing uh, seem, seems to me what lay, lay be, uh, behind uh, some attempts uh, to construe Leibnizian uh, primary matter as uh, some kind of late scholastic stuff uh, in which different forms are uh, there. Well, my answer is no. Leibniz does not do away with the sensible world. Leibniz claim uh, that the matter of thing is nothing uh, um, is uh, not to be taken as denying uh, our experience of the sensible world. Form and matter, even in Leibniz's uh, idiosyncratic version, uh, are primitive explanatory principles uh, that are supposed to account and give a reason uh, for the empirically observable uh, range of effects uh, in the sensible world uh, of which we have experience. The aim of Leibniz is to explain the world of objects and stuff as we experience it and not to deny it. In eliminating primary matter as a thing and less, Leibniz is not eliminating the facts of our experience of the world as encounters with the uh, uh, These empirically observable facts are illusions, but saying that they are phenomena being fundata, well founded phenomena expressing something which is ultimately real. In summa, this is a Leibniz Occam reason, ruthlessly shaving away any reducible entia in favor of minimal ontological commitments. I think that is what really drives uh, commitments. And uh, which does not uh, mean uh, denying that we experience stuff which is uh, resistance and standard and, and so on. So to conclude uh, all things considered, Leibniz metaphysics uh, is, uh, if we like, a form of immaterialism uh, insofar as uh, there is uh, no matter as a positive uh, ultimate ingredient of reality. Extended matter is a well-founded uh, phenomenon uh, grounded uh, in something which is not really standard. Secondary matter uh, reduces to monads and uh, finally, most importantly, there is no matter in uh, the ultimate constituent of uh, reality, the monads, uh, except as a way to describe the limitation of these monads. Thank you. Thank you very much. We would like to do start the discussion. Yes. I would, thank you for the paper. I have a very specific question.